Hello everyone, this is Father Peter, Father Peter Kazmarek, uh, giving these bi-weekly uh, sharings with you and we're delighted to, to talk about the, the Holy Martyrs of the Church of Rome today. It's, a, it's an interesting piece, somewhat unique because uh, it, uh, it, yes, it's not the, the only piece of a group of martyrs, but because it occurs so early in the church, uh, even during the ministry of Saints Peter and Paul in all of probability. But let, let's get the, the whole context, the whole framework. In the year 64, a great fire consumed most of Rome. Suspected of starting the fire, the Emperor Nero fixed the blame on the Christians. One by one they were rounded up, tortured, and murdered in his Nero's private gardens. Calling to mind the sufferings of these martyrs, Pope Clement exhorted his flock. We are placed in the same arena, and the same contest lies before us. Hence we ought to be put aside of vain and useless concerns. Let us fix our gaze on the blood of Christ, rendering, realizing how precious it is to his Father, since it was shed for our salvation and brought peace, the peace of the, and brought the grace of repentance to all the world. Anyway, this is the, as the, the pagan historians put it, they, they, they suspected that Nero was trying to do a little urban renewal, uh, kind of an ancient style. In other words, burned out a lot of the substandard housing uh, and so forth, the shanties and so forth that were in the, the, the heart of Rome so that the, the, the city could be turned into a magnificent, you know, imperial uh, area there. So, but on the other hand, the fires got out of control, so it seems, and quite a few people were consumed in the flames. There was a reaction to it against Nero, and Nero's now trying to blame the Christians for it. So the origin of this first persecution in Rome is, is really pretty, pretty clear. It's, it, we trace it back to Nero, we trace it back to the Great Fire, and of course, it really stands as a kind of a epitome of, of, the, of, the, of the sacrifice that Christians are asked to make. So we see now that uh, uh, and, and the, the, the Feast of these Martyrs follows very closely right behind the Feast of St. Paul and then the great Feast of St. Peter, Saints Peter and Paul the day before. So what I thought I would do, what I thought I would do, it would be a good thing to, let, let's look a little bit again at the, at the biographies of these great men, these great apostles, Peter and Paul. And I'm, the, the source that I'm going to use is Butler's Lives of the Saints. Butler's Lives of the Saints is a kind of a, a, a classic, really. It's a, they have a four-volume edition out, and I guess with, with the new media and so forth, they haven't come out with, a, with, a, with another one in a while. But uh, they, they probably will uh, do it. Uh, Alvin Butler was a, 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 an English bishop of the 18th century, believe it or not, when, when, Christ, when Catholicism wasn't even really fully legal in, in England even. And uh, he, he was a compiler of the stories of the saints. And he came out with, a, I think it was a two-volume work, uh, The Saints Up to His Time. Okay, it, and it became a kind of, a, among English Catholics, it became a kind of a, of, a, of a little classic. Many of them had it in their libraries, and, and if they wanted information about a saint, Butler was, was where, they, where, they, uh, where, they, where they looked. Now, uh, as the 19th century wove on, uh, many new saints were added to the calendar. At a certain point, a, a famous English Jesuit of the earlier part of the 20th century Herbert Thurston, who's an author, a speaker, and an erudite man, uh, expanded the expanded uh, Butler's Lives of the Saints and brought it up to around the year 1900. All right, uh, adding the new saints and so forth. Uh, in the 1960s, okay, after Herbert Thurston had died, uh, a learned layman, a learned English layman by the name of uh, Donald Atwater. Uh, did the final job, and what we have, the, this is one of the volumes of the four volume set. This is the Atwater completion. So I'm hoping now that since John Paul II canonized so many saints and so many new ones have been included, that somebody will kind of come along, come along after Butler, come along after Herbert Thurston, come along after uh, Donald Atwater, and give us a really updated version. But this is pretty good. This one's pretty good as far as it goes, and we're looking forward to the complete, a, a mini biography uh, uh, at least, and a little bit more extensive on some of the famous saints, but always with the, with the idea of brevity and conciseness in mind, so that we're not really getting volumes and volumes, but we're getting a, pers a, a kind of a little preci, a little, a little summary uh, of the life and with typical things brought out. Okay, so let me start then with uh, St. Peter. The story of St. Peter as recounted in the Gospels, is so familiar that there can be no need to retrace it here in detail. Well, thank God we don't have time for that anyway. We know that he was a Galilean, that his original home was at Bethsaida, that he was married, a fisherman, 
and that he was brother to the apostle St. Andrew. That's pretty, well, pretty, that's, those are pretty much the basic facts that we, that we really know about him. His name was Simon, but our Lord, on first meeting him, told him that he should be now called Kephas, the Aramaic equivalent of the Greek word whose English form is Peter, that is, rock. No one who reads the New Testament can be blind to the predominant role which is everywhere accorded to him among the immediate followers of Jesus. That's important, okay, that, that's, that it's important on several different levels because uh, actually the authority in the church is, is kind of fluid at this point in time. We don't have a hierarchy there. Jesus is, is, is in the middle of his preaching, but he's, ga he's gathering his, his, his apostles from his disciples. And Peter always, one way or another, has a kind of a central place uh, in, all, in all four gospels and in, 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 in all of the, most of the episodes, okay? It was he who, as spokesman for the rest, made the sublime profession of faith, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it was to him personally that our Savior, with the solemnity of phrase, which finds no parallel in the rest of the gospel narrative, addressed these words, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood have not revealed this to thee, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to thee, thou, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you to thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever you shall bind upon earth, it shall be bound also in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose upon earth, it shall be loosed also in heaven. No less familiar is the story of Peter's triple denial of his master in spite of the warning he had previously received. The very fact that his fall is recorded by all four evangelists with a fullness of detail which seems out of proportion to its relative insignificance amidst the incidents of our Savior's passion, in itself is a tribute to the position which St. Peter occupied among his followers. I think you can begin to see how the, uh, the, this, 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 the author of this is an astute person. He's, he's, he's really bringing us into to getting a sense of, of uh, you know, how, how the Lord wanted to work with Peter and how important his role you know, was to be. Of course, we, we, we have no problem as Catholics identifying Peter as the first pope, but the, the Christians who are separated from us in, in, in government, Protestants and Orthodox, okay, who have more difficulty with that. But nonetheless, they all acknowledge that Jesus picked out Peter for uh, a special role and that that is, is meant to be mirrored somehow you know, in, the, in, the, in the structure of the church. Also, of course, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to see how, how, it, it, it's, how the butler in, in the first instance points out that the, the, can Jesus conferring authority on St. Peter, that is, it's a unique passage, isn't it? There are other areas where Jesus confers authority, whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven them, and so forth. But this tremendous uh, emphasis on the person of Peter and the rock and, and the struggle of the church, it is really a unique passage, and often we should, we should ponder it, we should think about it when we think about the church. On the other hand, if our Lord's warning met with no response, we must also remember that it was prefaced by these astonishing words with their strange charge from change from the plural to the singular. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith may not fail, and thou, being once converted, confirm thy brethren. Equally impressive is the triple reparation which our Lord tenderly but almost cruelly exhorted from his shamefaced disciple beside the Sea of Galilee. When therefore they had, been, they, had, they had dined, Jesus said to Simon, Simon, son of John, lo lovest thou me more than these? He saith to him, Yes, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said to him, Feed my lambs. And, on, and then he saith unto him again, Simon, son of John, lovest thou me? He, said to, he saith to him, Yes, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith to him, Feed my lambs. And a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said to him, Lord, <coughs> thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And he said to him, Feed my sheep. But the prophecy which follows is almost more wonderful. For Jesus went on, Amen, amen, I say to you, when thou wast younger, thou didst gird thyself and did walk where thou wouldst. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch out thy hands, and another shall gird thee and lead thee where thou wouldst not go. And this he added the evangelist, he said, signifying by what death he should glorify God. 
After the ascension, we find Peter still everywhere taking a leading part. It was he who, na who, named, who was named first in the groups of the apostles, who in the upper room preserved, preserved with, with one mind in prayer, with, with, persevered with one mind in prayer with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, until the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. It was he also who took the initiative in choosing a new apostle in place of Judas. And when he first addressed the jeering crowd, bearing testimony to Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved by God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did through him in the midst of you, whom God raised from the dead, whereof all of we are witnesses. Further we are told, and when, he had heard, when they had heard all these things, they had compunction of heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what shall we do, men and brethren? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. So you see Peter then really is now comfortable with the role that he's, that he's been given by the Lord and he's effective. So having repented of his, of his weakness, I mean, he was, he was kind of a braggart. That was one of his, one of his faults. He, he, he liked to take the lead and liked to show, demonstrate his courage. Of course, his courage completely failed him the night of Jesus' death. Okay, but once he repented of that, got a grip on himself, wasn't he a magnificent, a magnificent uh, witness to the Lord? I mean, we, we know that there were struggles that come later on, that Peter and Paul had difficulties uh, working it out, how Gentiles could participate uh, in faith in Jesus in the early church, which was mostly Jewish. At that, you have to be Jewish first in order to be Christian, what, all of the controversies that surrounded that. And Peter sometimes, you know, didn't make the 1,000% uh, the right decisions about who to sit with or how to, how to arrange those things, but yet, uh, he, grew, he grew in the ministry, he grew in maturity in his response to things, and you know, was an effective witness uh, all the way along. So I think it was important for us to, to, to say a couple of things about St. Peter at a time like this. We think, about, uh, we think about our present situation with the Holy Father. He was, he was not, not well, he was confined to a wheelchair for a while. Now he's back again. There were, there were thoughts that he was going to resign because Pope Benedict had, had stepped down, but that was you know, a false rumor circulating around. So we as Catholics have had you know, quite a bit to absorb about the papacy in these last uh, couple of years, but we're, we're doing our very best to deal with it because we know how important the ministry of the popes are to the church. Uh, and in any event, I think it's important that we maybe stop here right now, and perhaps next week we'll say a few things about St. Paul. It's, uh, there's, a, there's that tremendous tradition of linking Peter and Paul together in the, in the, uh, in the ministry. Peter, the, the, uh, the fearless head of the church, the rock, uh, which, which would sustain the church in unity and harmony uh, through all the storms and, and confusions of doctrine and trouble, and Paul, that fearless preacher and greatest missionary perhaps of all time, uh, that, that eloquent voice, that, that voice that, that called everyone to repentance and belief, and you know, still stands today. So you, give the, you, have, you get Paul with the sword and the book, you get Peter with the keys, and together, you know, they really are the twin rocks, the twin pillars upon which the church is based and its continuance is guaranteed. Uh, and uh, next week we'll talk a little bit about St. Paul.